In the last video, we talked about solving linear systems with Gaussian elimination. Today, we're going to talk about matrix inversion. So just to remind you how Gaussian elimination worked, we started out with a linear system that looks something like this. We have a matrix A, some unknowns x, and they equal a vector b. Our goal, of course, is to recover x. And we do that by drawing an augmented matrix that looks something like this. Then what we did is manipulated this until we had it into reduced row echelon form, and then it made it easy to read off the solution. Now that's great and straightforward and makes sense, but you might reasonably wonder why it's so bespoke. That is to say that, you know, it seems very specific to a particular A and a particular B. But you might reasonably wonder, well, what if I had the same A for some new problem but a different B? Would I have to do all that work all over again? So one thing you might notice is that when we did the manipulations of A in order to turn them into reduced row echelon form, we did also manipulations of B, but the things we did, the scalars we multiplied different rows by and the ways we added them together in order to get those zeros and those ones, that didn't depend on the particular choice of B. So we could actually do the same kind of manipulations to multiple Bs at the same time and have multiple columns on the right-hand side here. That is to say, we could, if we wanted to, write something like this. We could have our A as before, and then in the augmented form, have, say, a B1 and also a B2 if we wanted. And that would be a totally reasonable thing. As we manipulated the A to get into reduced row echelon form, we would do the same operations to both B1 and B2. One thing you might also note is that when we find an X that is the solution to one of these problems for a particular B, that we also get solutions for all of the scalings of that B. That is to say, let's imagine we solve this and we find some X such that AX equals B. And now, if I multiply that B by some lambda, for some lambda, where lambda is a scalar, and I wanted to ask the question, now what's the x that solves that system? Then it turns out that that is just going to be lambda multiplied by x. Being a little bit more concrete, if I have an a x that solves for b, then that implies that a lambda x solves for lambda b. That's a useful thing to know because that means when we do the work for 1b, we actually get a bunch of solutions at once. Then the third thing to know is that if we have the solution to two different problems, then we also have the solution to their sums. What do I mean by that? Let's imagine that we solved this guy here. And now we have an x1, say, for b1, and an x2, say, for b2. So what do I mean here? Let's imagine that we wanted to solve the problem a x equals b for, say, a b1, and we solve that, and we find that we get an x1. And then we also solve another problem for a different b. And imagine that we get b2. So if we have the solution to both of these linear systems, and if someone handed us a new problem and wanted to know what's the x that solves for b1 plus b2, then that's x1 plus x2. This is easy to see by just adding both equations. We have a x1, say, plus a x2, and then we say that's equal to b1 plus b2. All I'm doing is adding these two equations together on each side, and then a is distributing over x1 and x2 to equal b1 plus b2. So if somebody handed you this, then you would say that the solution was x1 plus x2. Both of these properties are the properties of linearity. That is to say, these are linear systems, and so scaling and multiplication interact with the functions in a straightforward way. So we can see that we have the possibility of saving ourselves some work, because we can solve for multiple b's at once and then use those in combinations. And then in fact, we can use them in linear combinations by scaling them as we need to. So what that means is that if someone hands you a b, and let's say the b new for it being a new, a new vector that we wanna solve, we've solved a set of problems before, so we have some b's and some xi's, 
And let's imagine that we can write this as a sum over problems that we solved before. And let's imagine that it looks like this. So what we're saying is that this new problem that we want to solve can be written as a linear combination of problems that we've solved before. So let's just emphasize this by saying, you know, these are old and solved. Then what that means is that we can take the old solutions, say xi, and get x nu just by making a linear combination of those. So these xi are the solutions to those old solved problems. And so just like that, without having to do any Gaussian elimination or any more manipulation of A, we were able to construct a new solution out of old solutions. Now you might ask yourself the question, okay, well maybe I don't know exactly what B I'm going to be asked, what this B nu is going to be. What work can I do in advance that would allow me to solve for any B you might ever hand me? And that's what a matrix inverse is all about. Because all we need to do is solve a set of problems before that represent what we call a basis for B. Now we'll talk more about bases in a lecture or two, but for now, let's just take it for granted that if we have a rich enough set of Bs that we can pre-compute their solutions and then generate solutions for any new problem that we want to solve. Then when you have that set, what you do is you plug it in as the sequence of Bs on the right-hand side of Gaussian elimination, solve for all those guys at once. Now, if you have a new problem you want to solve and you've done that work before, all you need are the lambdas in order to be able to find the solution for the new problem. And it turns out you don't even need to think very hard about what basis vectors to use in these Bs. The natural one is what we would call the canonical basis. That is the set of vectors that just has a one in each entry and then zeros everywhere else. So let's look at that in more detail with an example. Let's imagine that we have a matrix A. Let's say two, four, negative two, four, nine, negative three, and negative two, negative three, seven. Now what I said before is we want to do Gaussian elimination for a set of vectors all at once that will allow us to solve for any kind of B that we might encounter in the future. And the easiest choice is to choose essentially the identity matrix. That is to say, to choose the matrix one, 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 zero, 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 zero. So this is what I was referring to as the canonical basis. Don't worry too much about what I mean by that. All that you need to notice about this is that if I take the columns of these, I can blend them together to make any B I want. And it turns out that if I do Gaussian elimination for this set of vectors, that the numbers that I'll get on this right-hand side afterwards are going to be the inverse of A, assuming the inverse exists. So let's do this example just for practice. We'll start off by getting zeros here and here. So how would we do that for this row? Well, we would say, let's make a new R2 in which we take the old R2 and subtract 2 minus R1. And then for this R3, let's get a new R3 by taking the old R3 and adding R1. So after we make those transformations, we get a new augmented matrix. The top row is still the same because we didn't change anything. We now have a zero here. And after those modifications, this is one, one, negative two, one, zero. A zero here, one, five, one, zero, one. For the next step, let's take R3 and subtract off R2. And then after we do that, get a new augmented matrix, two, four, negative two, one, zero, zero. We still have zero, one, one, negative two, one, zero. Now we have zero, zero, four, three, negative one, one. Now let's scale R3 by a factor of one quarter. The idea here being to turn that four into a one. After we do that scaling, we get two, four, negative two. This is still the same. And of course, zero, one, one, negative two, one, zero. And then now zero, zero, one, three quarters, negative one quarter, 
and one quarter. Now I'm going to move this up to continue working this out. Move this up here. So to continue getting it, this into reduced row echelon form, then I need to get a zero here and a zero here. And of course, I eventually want to get a one in, uh, in there. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to add two times R3, and then I'm going to divide all of that by two. To get rid of this one, then I'm going to subtract off R3. After I do that, I have one, two, zero, five quarters, negative one quarter, one quarter. And then here I have zero, one, zero, negative 11 quarters, five quarters, negative one quarter. And then down here I have zero, zero, one, three quarters as before, negative one quarter, and one quarter. And we are almost home. The last thing I need to do is remove that two. And I'm going to do that by subtracting off two times R2. Finally, we get to reduced row echelon form. On the left, we have the identity. On the right, we have 27 fourths, negative 11 fourths, 3 fourths, negative 11 fourths, 5 fourths, 3 quarters. And this, on the right hand side, is now the inverse of A. Now, sometimes a matrix doesn't have an inverse. So when we talk about a square matrix that has no inverse, we call that a singular matrix. Let's do Gaussian elimination for a singular matrix just to see what that looks like. So let's imagine that we have a matrix A, 2, 3, negative 2, 1, negative 2, 3, 4, negative 1, 4. Now what we do is we do the augmented matrix as before by putting an identity over on the right hand side. So this isn't equal to A anymore, so I'll erase that. So let's proceed with Gaussian elimination as before. Job one is to remove this entry and this entry and turn those into zeros. So we're gonna do that by taking R2 and making it into two times R2 minus R1 and then we'll make R3 into R3 minus two times R1. After we do that, we get a new matrix, two, three, negative two, one, zero, zero. We get a zero here, negative seven, eight, negative one, two, zero, zero, negative seven, eight, and zero, zero, one. Now, probably you can already see that we're getting into trouble here because these two rows are the same on the left-hand side, but they're not the same on the right-hand side. So let's keep going. In order to get a zero here, we're going to take R3 and we're going to subtract off R2. Let's do that. Zero, negative seven. But now we're getting a zero, zero, zero with a one, negative two, one. Okay, so this is making us sad. Now, this is making us sad because we have zeros over here and things that aren't zero over here. So there's nothing we could do that would satisfy this last equation, assuming that we solve the rest of this. So this is an overdetermined problem, and that means this matrix is singular. You can think of that as essentially being the situation in which it's not possible to construct a set of vectors and then solve in such a way that we could get to any possible b, that there are b's that we can't reach. One of the things that is extremely confusing about applied linear algebra and that you encounter in machine learning and statistics and lots of other fields is that people in books and papers write matrix inverses all the time, and yet you almost never actually want to take an inverse when you write code that does linear algebra. So that is to say, like in this course later, we'll see things like the multivariate Gaussian distribution that inside an exponential will have something that looks like x minus mu 
where these are vectors transpose. And don't worry about the details of this, except that I'm going to write some notation that looks like that, where this is a covariance matrix. And you will see this written on the Wikipedia page, say, for the multivariate Gaussian distribution. Or maybe you're doing like linear regression, like in 324 or 424, and you'd see an expression maybe for the solution that would look like something, I don't know, maybe some big matrix X transpose X. Again, don't worry about the details of exactly what this means so much as observe that you'll likely see this in many textbooks and you have this big matrix that has a net, you know, raised to the power of negative one implying that you should take an inverse. And so if you were to write the code for this, you'd say, okay, yeah, take that object, compute that thing and call inv in you know, NumPy linear algebra. Turns out you should almost never do that. This notation implies that you should solve the linear system that is attached there and that you shouldn't actually compute the inverse. The reason for this is that taking the matrix inverse is not a stable operation. What I mean by that is that on a real computer that has imperfect precision to represent real numbers, that is what we call floating point numbers, then errors can accumulate when you do different kinds of computation. And so if a computation is called numerically unstable, then what that means is that those errors can accumulate in bad ways and you can get surprising answers. That is to say that like a small round off error somewhere could result in a large error in the overall computation. Let me just walk you through a simple example to give you the flavor of what the instability or the sort of sensitivity of a matrix inversion might look like. Let's imagine that we have a really simple matrix, two by two, and let's imagine that it is as a 100, 100, 100, but over here we have a 100 plus epsilon. Where epsilon, let's make epsilon something like, I don't know, 0 0.01, something pretty small relative to the 100. Now in the two by two case, we can just write down the inverse directly, it turns out. So let's do that. Let's say inverse, that's 100 times 100 minus 100 times 100 plus epsilon. And then over here we get 100, negative 100 plus epsilon, negative 100. Okay, so far so good. This number is nearly negative 100. But let's look at the denominator of this. So we have 100 on both sides. So let's write this out. We're going to have 100 times 100, I'll just say 100 squared, minus 100 squared, minus 100 multiplied by epsilon. Of course, these cancel out, and we keep our negative 100s over here. So we're in this situation, and then let's simplify it a little bit further, remove the 100s all the way around. We get something that is now negative 1 over epsilon. We get 1, negative 1. We get something that's approximately 1, right? So we have a negative 100 plus epsilon divided by 100, right? So that's very nearly 1, and then a 1 here. So even though epsilon was tiny relative to 100, it can have an outsized effect on what we get here, right? So if epsilon was about 0 0.01, then 1 over epsilon is about 100. So we can see here that epsilon now, despite being very small relative to 100 here, like having a very small effect on this matrix, we can see that it has a huge effect on its inverse. So if epsilon was about 0 0.01, we're taking 1 divided by that, so that's about 100, and then multiplying that by a matrix that is essentially just a, a bunch of things of magnitude 1. So if epsilon was 0 0.01, this whole thing will essentially look like a negative 100, negative 100, right? On the other hand, what if epsilon was 0.01? 0, 1. Now, in absolute terms for this original matrix, that is a tiny change. This is 1 one hundredth of 1% 1 of a change in this entry. That's the only difference. And yet, what's going to happen now? 1 divided by epsilon is going to give us now a very large matrix, right? It's going to make this a lot bigger. Now this is going to be a thousand, thousand, so now the magnitude of this matrix has been increased by a factor of 10, despite it being a tiny, tiny change in this entry of the matrix. So this is what we talk about 
we talk about inversion being an unstable kind of computation, that it's possible for a small numeric error to have a giant effect on the result. So if you're not actually supposed to take an inverse whenever you write code to do applied linear algebra, then what are you supposed to actually do? If you're solving a small dense problem and you only really have to do it once, then it's totally reasonable to just go in and call the solve function and say numpy linear algebra. Behind the scenes, that will be implemented in a reasonable way probably to solve that problem efficiently and stably. People have been working on these kinds of things for a long, long time. If you're gonna solve a problem multiple times though, and it's relatively small, then a typical kind of strategy would be to do some kind of decomposition of the matrix. You decompose it into parts, each of which is easy to solve, so it's a kind of divide and conquer strategy. For example, a common thing to do is an LU decomposition. So we would have our matrix A that we're trying to solve a system with, maybe, so we're kind of in this situation. And we would take A, and decompose it, say, into a matrix L that is lower triangular and a matrix U that is upper triangular. Now, triangular systems are those that we find to be relatively easy to solve because it's almost possible to just perform substitution in them directly. So what we're doing then is taking this problem and turning it into one that looks like this. Assuming A is invertible, then what this lets us do is focus first on a system that's lower triangular with L and then a system that's upper triangular with U. So the way that would work is you would first solve the problem L Y equals B. That is, you would find the Y associated with this system. And then when you had that, you would solve the system U X equals Y. So you'd then be finding the X such that everything sort of mapped out to form the B. Other kinds of decompositions that might make inversion easy include like the singular value decomposition that we'll study in a couple weeks, as well as like the QR decomposition and other things. Now these are the kinds of strategies that you might use when you're solving smallish kinds of uh, systems of linear equations. So that would be where A is a few thousand by a few thousand. It's also something that you would tend to use in a situation where A is dense, which is where it doesn't have that many zeros in it. These are the kinds of problems that we usually encounter in machine learning that are not that big and they tend to be dense. On the other hand, a lot of uses of linear algebra are in like structural mechanics and things like that, where A might be very sparse. And in those cases, we often take a completely different kind of strategy to solving systems of linear equations. And what we do there often is use what are called iterative methods. So the idea of an iterative solver is to construct some kind of initial guess for what the value of the solution is x, and then apply an iteration until x hopefully converges to the solution. So there are a lot of different kinds of these for different situations. The two to kind of broadly be aware of are like something like a Jacobi method, where you would take the matrix A and divide it up into the sum of a diagonal piece. So this is just the bits of A that are on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else, and then everything left over. And then you would come up with some guess of the solution to x, let's call it x0 for the initial guess, and then you'd perform iterations where we take, say, iteration i, we hit it with this matrix r, so not solving a system, just multiplying r by this matrix. We look at the difference between that and b, and then we solve that linear system with d, but that's very easy because d is just diagonal, so all you have to do is invert the elements on the diagonal of d. And then that gives you a new iterate xi plus one. And the idea of something like an iterative Jacobi type method would be to iterate this until these converge to the solution. There are a whole class of algorithms like this that have this general kind of recipe, depending on exactly what the properties of a are, where you take a, turn it into some smaller pieces, and then perform some kind of iteration until it converges. The other broad kind of, of iterative method treats the solution to a linear system as an optimization problem. So we might talk about the distance between b and a x. Now don't worry too much about this, but just take it for granted that I'm talking about the distance between two vectors here. And then the idea would be to try to write down a program that minimizes this distance via, say, Newton's method or something like that. And so a common approach to this is something called the conjugate gradient method. These can be very powerful when A is very sparse because then these multiplications of A times X's might be very inexpensive. I don't expect you to really know how these work in this course. It's just these are things that you should generally be aware of when you encounter 
applied linear algebra problems in the wild.